uh, see in the previous lecture we did two hypotheses on presentation. Then I would have done the terms like cloud burst and cloud seeding and then types of presentation. Now we come to the last part of this topic that is forms of presentation. Now see, once cloud is formed, we understand that in this cloud you have large number of water droplets and or ice crystals. So it means vapor of the atmosphere has condensed into droplets and or sublimed into ice crystals. Now, this moisture which is there in the cloud, in what form does it reach to me on the earth's surface? This is what we call as form of precipitation. There are numerous forms of precipitation in nature, but we need to do in today's lecture five major forms and they would be what you already know. If it is in the form of large drops of water, we call it as rain. If it is a solid precipitation, we call it as snow. If it is a spray like rainfall, means drops of water are very very small, then we call it as drizzle. And then we have a solid form, when you have solid like a stone, the snow and ice, then it is called as hail. And we have one form called sleet, in which you will have mix of the liquid and the solid precipitation, like rain and say hail, or you may have rain and snow etc. So when you have mix of the two, then we call it as sleet. So these are the five major forms of precipitation. But in some other lecture, for some reason, there is a little difference. We will be doing fog, mist and haze also as forms of precipitation. Since there is a little difference in the process, small difference, so we can discuss it separately under some other discussion. Okay. So today I will give you five forms of precipitation and then I will conclude this topic and we will go to a fresh area. So this would be separately. But besides this, can, there can be other forms of precipitation also. Right? But they are not so important for our lecture here, for the exam. So let's cover these five major forms. But before we start, one simple but important point to understand is that once the cloud is formed and it is ready to precipitate, remember, we said these cloud particles, the droplets and ice crystals, they are too many in the cloud, but generally what is the problem? They are too small to come to us. And that is what we discussed in hypothesis, how can they grow perhaps. Though we do not have any final concluding statement on this, but we have some idea about how the process happens. And then second problem is it has to, when it starts its journey towards the earth's surface, this particle has to overcome two problems on the way. That is prelims and means. <laughs> right? One is that it should be able to overcome the evaporation on the way. Because it has to pass through warmer layers of the atmosphere. Because generally when we go up, there is a decrease of temperature with increase of height. Whereas for this particle, the journey is opposite. As it comes lower to the earth's surface, mostly it would have to experience warmer layers of the atmosphere and some layer may be so warm that it can get evaporated and the story will get over. And the second is that it has to overcome the convection currents of an area. You know everywhere in the world, to some or the other degree, <coughs> the air is rising what we call as convectional currents or we call as turbulence in the atmosphere. So those rising currents may take these particles again up and down many a times before they can really fall on the air surface. So they have to overcome evaporation and the turbulence of the atmosphere. Now for today's lecture I will say the moisture which is coming to me on the air surface finally in what form does it reach to me it will depend on two things here. Two things of the atmosphere, the one is temperature because it might happen that you had ice crystals being formed which led to the formation of what I call as snowflakes means when ice crystals will grow in size we can use the term snowflakes. So it starts as solid presentation but on the way in its journey it may melt on the way and, and I may get liquid presentation. Or we will see if the cloud is vertically developed like cumulonimbus cloud who knows that snowflake may become bigger and bigger 
and becomes a solid stone of ice, we call it as hail. So, <coughs> what is the temperature of this atmosphere in which the precipitation takes place? This is one important consideration which will decide form of precipitation. Do I get liquid or do I get solid? And second, for snow to become something like a hail, you need a lot of growth process. When you pick up a stone called hail, you certainly would have a common sense idea that it has grown layer by layer, that there is a lot of growth of it and for that growth you need to have the snowflake spending a good amount of time in this environment. Yes or no? So when snowflake is coming down in a vertically developed cloud of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 kilometers, it is moving through a rich environment where you have a lot of moisture in the form of the ice crystals or liquid droplets or vapor, so it may keep growing. So if a snowflake spends a lot of time in the atmosphere, it has all the chances to become a stone of ice. And for it to spend time in the atmosphere, what it needs is rising air. The turbulence should be more. So one particle is coming down, it grows, but again by the rising currents it's taken up again. So if it spends more time here, it will grow into what is called as hail. So two things are important for the form of precipitation to get finalized. One, the temperature of the atmosphere and second, the degrees of turbulence in the atmosphere. So let's start with this opening point and then it's very easy topic. We'll just take 30-40 minutes for each of these, like we'll complete all five forms in the next half an hour and then we'll start in the next area. So please write. Several forms of precipitation. Several forms of precipitation can result can result from collision coalescence collision coalescence and ice crystal formation processes and ice crystal formation processes. I hope you remember these two. Remember last time we had done these hypotheses from, I repeat, collision, coalescence and ice crystal formation processes. The right, the next sentence. The form that results, the form that results depends largely the form that results depends largely on the temperature of the air and its degree of turbulence and its degree of turbulence. That's all. Now let's go for five minutes on each of these. They are all very simple. So write first rain and give me a few minutes on the board. <coughs> write the first form, rain. Now let's check first what points I'll make you write. There are three or four points to be written. Just let's see it on the board first. Now the first thing I'll make you write is that Rain is the term used officially for drops of water which range in diameter from 0.5 mm to 6 mm. Now, generally 6 mm is the upper limit because if it is a drop larger than this, it would happen to split into two parts. So generally we see this as the limit. In some books you may find 0.5 mm to 5 mm. So this is just an approximation idea. So this is the range for which we use the term rain. It means in later, I am going to say when the drop is less than 0.5 mm in diameter, then I am going to call it as drizzle, right? So this is rain's definition. Second, can I say, rain is the most widespread form of precipitation. Means if I see the whole world, this is the most commonly available form of precipitation. And not only it is most widespread, at a given place, 
it is more frequent than any other form of respiration. So my notes will say it is most widespread as well as most commonly formed kind of or form of precipitation. Second, third I can say that up in the atmosphere there may be water droplets where dew point is more than 0 degree centigrade. Remember, there can be two kinds of clouds up in the atmosphere. We say warm cloud or cold cloud. By cold cloud we mean where dew point is more than 0 degree centigrade, roughly speaking. So, it's more than 0 degree centigrade and you have water droplets being formed. So, what I get as rain on the earth's surface, it may start from the cloud as rain only, means liquid droplets or the other possibility is that up in the cloud it was ice crystals, snowflakes, but on the way they had to pass through warmer layers of the atmosphere and they happen to melt on the way. So, I get rain in both the, so either of the two cases, whether dew point is more than or less than 0 degree centigrade, we may get this rain as the form of precipitation. Okay. So, preside these simple points. Preside, the term rain refers to the drops of liquid water, drops of liquid water, put a hyphen and write, from 0.5 mm, from 0.5 mm, to 6 mm in diameter. Second, it is the most common and widespread form of precipitation. It is the most common and widespread form of precipitation. <coughs> and third point you write, it forms, it forms when dew point temperature, it forms when dew point temperature is more than freezing, is more than freezing and by the melting of ice crystals and by the melting of ice crystals as they pass through as they pass through the warmer layers of the atmosphere, as they pass through the warmer layers of the atmosphere. Now I write second, snow. Now please build the boat. See here. One, the snow is solid form of precipitation and particularly it would be seen in higher latitudes and higher altitudes of the lower latitudes. Means I will generally get in the middle at higher latitudes here. It is not a form generally seen in terms of tropical areas, but within tropical areas I may get it in higher elevations. Remember I taught you one small point, altitude mimics latitude. So in India or in tropical areas, I need mountains where I may have snow as such. So it is more a feature of the middle and higher latitudes and higher altitudes of lower latitude. Now, you know the snow appears white for the reason that the ice crystals which are there in that snow, they basically act like a prism. They scatter light in all possible directions and therefore the color would appear white. And when you pick up the freshly fallen snow, it won't be that wet in feel as you would have expected. Because see, snow is <coughs> a result of dry conditions of the world. Means, uh, if you remember that we are saying colder the air, lesser is the <coughs> Moisture in that area, yes or no? So the moisture content in that snow in the beginning is very less. But yes, at higher level we teach, layer by layer when snow is there in one area, it will keep changing its structure. 
and will try to will tend to convert itself into the solid ice. So as it turns into that solid structure, it has more wetness in it. But if it is freshly fallen snow, it would be dry in its feel as such. And it is only for the reason that the moisture content in the beginning is very less. But with the growth process, that content would keep increasing the given volume that snow rises. Now, today we will not discuss it much, but in my another lecture where I deal with climate change, this snow cover which is there in this area of the world will, very, will become very important for us. Now, I might have mentioned in some lecture one phenomenon, one, one property called albedo. <coughs> Did I mention this word? Yes. Now, albedo means reflectivity of a surface. Mm. That out of the total incident energy on a surface, how much percentage gets reflected back? Now, this snow cover, the snow and ice have very high albedos. Depending on the structure of it, the albedo of snow and ice may vary from 70 to 90 percent. It means out of the energy which is incident on the surface of the snow, as much as 90 percent can get reflected back. So it means you will say that in this area we have a permanent snow cover because it's very cold area. Insulation doesn't reach much here. But then finally we also need to know that whatever little insulation reaches here, as much as 70 to 90 percent of it gets reflected. reflected back and that itself is a reason for its permanent cover here. Now you would have noticed that whenever you read an article on climate change, sooner or later the scholars, the authors of those articles take you to this area, yes or no? Because see, here because of global warming, this snow and ice has started melting on a larger scale what it used to be earlier. So don't you think, once the global, like because of global warming, this area snow and ice would melt, the albedo of this area will start decreasing. It means, if I use one systems approach terminology, I, I don't know whether I have mentioned it earlier in my class or not, this will lead to something called as positive feedback mechanism. Did I use the term feedback in any lecture? So, let, I'll go for five minutes on the margin and explain one term which would be very important for any subject in life and especially for climate change and all that. Means you can use it in any optional, in any GS, it, it will work everywhere. Just be on the board. Today, many sciences use an approach called systems approach. Like many institutes in India, like IITs, etc., they even do the whole MBA course based on systems approach. Means all sciences today are using systems approach because it is an approach which can deal with complexities of life much better than any other approach. For example, in ecology classes, your lecture would have started with the concept called ecosystem. Now, what is the ecosystem? It is a systemic approach to look at the environment. That when you look at the nature in terms of a system, that gives you the concept called ecosystem. So that British scholar, your teacher would have mentioned by the name, Tensley. Did this name come? So Tensley gave us the concept of ecosystem in 1930s. So it is like the systems approach used in handling or analyzing environment. We can use the systems approach in every part of our life and it handles complexities better than any other approach. And second beauty of this approach is it can handle a given reality at the level you desire. For example, I am taking the example which you are familiar with, ecosystem. Use of systems approach to analyze environment. Pond is an ecosystem. Aquarium at home is an ecosystem, right? But on the other hand, I can say the ocean is an ecosystem, yes or no? Or the whole biosphere is the ecosystem. So any scale I can use it. I can say this plant, not tell me from your ecology lectures, from 8 to 10.30 today, are we an example of ecosystem? Yes. Certainly yes. We have 
biotic elements in the class, we all, right? We have abiotic elements. We are interacting with each other as per certain norms. Yes or no? <laughs> Means it's, it's, it's understood that as I deliver my lecture, you will not disturb me. And as I deliver my lecture, I will not disturb your attention also for other things of life. Right? I will only deal with the subject matter. So we are being governed, right? Outside the class, we may be less governed by these norms, no? But yes, again, society also demands some norms between the, like amongst the elements of the class. So, system or approach is something which I can use at any level I desire. That is the good. So, this approach is good for complexities and the analysis level can change as per your desire, as per your requirement. Now, those who are not getting what is like, since I have not defined it, so what is systems approach? Systems approach is any reality you wish to study, you give it a systems definition. Now, what does that mean? Whatever reality you want to study, you see it in the light of the elements it comprises. For example, keep this classroom as an example of a system. So I say, I want to study this class, our gathering every day, uh, through systems approach. So I'll see this classroom, our gathering here, as a system. By this I mean three things. I will identify the elements comprising this reality. So what are the elements? All my students in the class, including me, plus the staff member. We are all elements of this reality. So when I say I define my reality called this lecture in terms of systems approach, I identify it in terms of, yes please, elements comprising the reality. Second, I identify the relationships among all the elements. So we are governed by certain relationship among the elements. So this is my system within which you have elements and these elements are bound together by some relationships. And what is the third element or third, third part of this definition? The relationship between all of us and our environment. So third level is, I identify the relationships among or should I say between all the elements and the environment. What is our immediate environment? Our institute, no? All directions to govern this classroom comes from there. They have a check, right? Are the classes going properly or not? So. Whenever I wish to define any reality, something which is not otherwise making sense to me, anything what is complex in life, you can make it easy by identifying three things. Number one in terms of elements. I just keep patience on the board and I give you if you wish, though I never intended, I was just to give a feedback, but I have I've started something larger than that. Within 10 minutes, you will get to know an approach to write better answers in every exam in life. Would you like to go over it? Yes, yes I do. <laughs> okay, before that, then I discuss for two minutes extra something. In every subjective examination, like main examination, there is one common problem for all of us since school days. See here, there are two kinds of questions you have in main examination or any subjective examination. The questions I have prepared at home. Yes or no? And the questions which are new, we have to think and write. Now, questions which you have prepared, you will vomit out in the examination. No? You don't need any, any good thinking there. The moment question is there, you vomit out, depending on the marks there. No? We always say structured vomiting is required. <laughs> don't vomit as you know, see the marks on the right hand side. right? So questions which are prepared, I don't need to think much. But think of those questions where you have to think and write. Exceptions may be there in the class, but most of us there was one problem. On a question where you had to think and write, first idea came immediately. But after first idea, there was mental stuckness in the examination. Yes or no? By mental stuckness, I refer to that time where I was trying to think about the next idea, but it never came. And I am talking about those moments of the examination hall where you could see every physical reality of the classroom, the room itself, where the plaster is good, where the color is fading. And once that was over, you shift it to the invigilator's body. Yes or no? The clothes he or she is wearing, what kind of person he or she would be at home. Right? That period is called as the period of mental stuckness. 
each one of us has suffered from it and when time was running out i leave that question i went to the next question with the hope that ideas will come right you can keep the examination in mind essay writing remember every essay would be a new topic there yes or no you can't have a prepared kind of an essay in upsc so you will have to think and write someone has said to write a good essay you need a good idea will we agree with this and i add to that to have a good idea you need to have many ideas only then you will choose the best idea no and to have many ideas you need to have an efficient thinking in the exam issue but problem in the exam hall is that we have suffered from mental stuckness so how can you avoid mental stuckness you can avoid mental stuckness in the examination if you prepare about thinking what you have to do in the examination most of us have one problem and one mistake we think in the examination for the first time yes or no we don't train our mind to think efficiently in our daily life so what is what i'm trying to take you to is somewhere else i take a lecture where i give a title to my lecture as thinking about thinking in the examination so you have to think in the examination but if you do it for the first time without any preparation you will have mental stuckness but if you train in these months when you are coming to our classes you need to train about that thinking by thinking now so think about that thinking which you have to do in the examination and you will find ideas will come faster so today i give you one technique there are many of them we teach one technique where you can generate ideas on a topic where you didn't have so many good ideas and this is one is systems approach whatever is the topic of the day break it into three parts describe that reality you want to write on in terms of elements try to understand what are the elements describing this reality for example i take a popular topic so that you can think of how i'm going to generate let's say you have to write an essay on the practice called surrogacy everyone knows in the class what it is <coughs> now i i i'm not getting ideas to write on and remember problem is if you do not have a proper way of thinking then ideas will come at random yes or no and that order in which they come may not be good the idea which had to be in the introduction might come in conclusion right so it won't give you a good essay so you must have ideas before you write this <coughs> so what you can do is this is a topic you systems approach describe this reality called surrogacy in terms of elements so what the elements comprising this reality can i say when surrogacy is my topic the elements comprising are that couple which wishes to have a child yes miss then they need a surrogate mother then the child who is going to take birth itself is an element of this reality then can i say government institutions the regular regulatory bodies today then you have the medical group the institution the doctors who are involved in this then the larger society is also an element yes or no so identify these kind of elements i'm cutting it short you can think further second think of relationships among the elements now think of the couple and mothers surrogate mothers relationship then even that surrogate husband that female husband is involved because there has to be permission in a way the kind of society we are so there is a husband of that female also who is going to take that role as a surrogate mother so try to understand the relationships for example many a times you hear about the child who takes birth for that child this surrogate mother develops an emotional bond later she is not ready to give that child so such kind of relationship that relation between all of them and their environment for example these days these couples want a tailor made child of a particular complexion of a particular caste and all that and that is what is the basis to choose the surrogate mother so look at the whole set of elements and the environment and try to understand find out the relationships tell me would you be able to generate ideas faster or not earlier you were thinking in vacuum without any particular specific now you are doing it in a structured fashion first you think of elements then you think of relationships among the elements and between them and their environment
Bhagavad Gita. Apply it in any subject of your life, you will find answer writing in every option will become easier. Now, I leave this here. There are other techniques also we teach, but that may come sometime later. Now, let's come to systems operation. If this is a system, means some operational part, you know there is an input, there is a working, the process, and there is an output. There can be more than one input and more than one output, but I just take one simple idea. Now, what is feedback? Yes, anyone who will define feedback? <laughs> feedback. Experience about the processing which we feel. Feedback, yeah, I'm not asking English meaning of the term. Your body language was not positive in the class, so I thought I'll ask you, perhaps you know. Yes, very good. See here. Feedback is when this output or a part of this output goes back to influence the system's operations again. You do something in life, some process happens, there is an output of that. But you know in life, that output comes back to you. Yes or no? You do something, some result is there, it is not over, no? It comes back. MJ Akbar. <laughs> this is just to make your understand like easier, but of the record. So input leads to some operational part. There's an output. What is feedback? When a out when the output or a part of the output comes back to influence the system's operation. That is called feedback. Write this on the margin, and it would be very important for all the subjects as well as climate change in particular. Please right. The term feedback refers to the output or a part of the output the output or the part of the output which influences the system's operations or processes you can write which influence the system's operation systems operation now please write Feedback is of two types. The feedback is of two types. Yes, please. Which feedback? Positive. positive feedback and negative feedback. So, right, two positive and negative feedbacks. Positive and negative feedback. But remember here, now be on the board. Positive feedback doesn't mean something good of the system only. And negative is not for something bad of the system. Positive and negative feedback is vis-a-vis -vis the change you are focusing on. See here, any feedback which enhances a change, which amplifies a change, whether the change is for good or bad, that's not the concern. Any change, if it is getting enhanced or it is getting amplified by any feedback, then that feedback is positive feedback. For example, if my focus is on environment degradation of India, then do appreciate deforestation is a positive feedback. Because more the trees you cut, more the degradation. So deforestation is a positive feedback for the change called environment degradation. And any government program on deforestation would be what kind of feedback? Negative feedback. Because negative feedback would be something what? dampens a change. So present positive feedback is one which enhances or you can use the word amplification which amplifies a change. And right negative feedback is something which dampens a change. Which dampens a change. <coughs> and how many will understand if I give one very important point for all the subjects and nature in particular, that negative feedback will be the basis of equilibrium of the systems. Means what will bring the system back to equilibrium? Positive feedback or negative feedback? Negative always. So right this point, you can use it in daily life everywhere. Please right? Negative feedback is the basis of equilibrium of the systems. Negative feedback is the basis for the equilibrium of the system. Now, those who don't understand, let's go for 
one or two simple examples. You have some problem, medically speaking, you have some problem, let's say fever or some other change in the body. You go to a doctor for a medical treatment. Is that medical treatment a positive feedback or negative feedback? Yeah. Negative feedback. Whatever change you have seen, you want to dampen that change in the body, right? Similarly, when you take a drug addict to a rehab program, all rehabilitation programs of the world are what kind of feedbacks? They are negative, negative feedbacks. Otherwise, the drug addict at home can tell the family members, don't worry, these days I'm on a positive feedback. <laughs> Remember, the people at home may not understand that he is going on higher doses. <laughs> so, because positive feedback is amplification of the change. So once the family will understand, then the family will take, them, take, the, take the person to the rehab program. Now, see here. Now I come to my point, why did I mention, I am basically preparing for preparing you for climate change topic later. Human interventions in nature have led to many changes. Each change which is happening could play the role of positive feedback or negative, negative feedback, right? Or sometimes nature is so complex, one part of that change may be positive feedback and the other may be negative feedback. So why you don't have any final comment by any 